So I've posted a copy of Peter Singer's important paper, Famine, Affluence, and Morality, uh, to Blackboard. You can take a look at that, and we'll discuss um, how it is that we go into you know, a slightly more complex argument like this one and uh, determine the, the conclusion, what some of the premises are, and what some of the inferences are. So go ahead and, if you haven't already done so, take a look at that paper. You don't need to go back to Blackboard. You, ju you can just Google famine, affluence, and morality, and you'll, you'll find a copy of this paper online. So go ahead and do that. Take a look at it. It's about 6,000 words. It should take you maybe 40 minutes to read, and then we'll um, come back and, and um, restart the video. Thanks. Good. So Singer's paper, Famine, Affluence, and Morality, is one of the classics in, as I mentioned, one of the classics in um, contemporary um, ethics. It's a relatively simple argument. Um, so let's look at the text, and then we'll unpack some of the steps in the argument and some of the main points. Um, but let's just begin with reading. So as we read the paper, you'll notice that the first paragraph or so is really just a, an attempt to set the stage for the context of the argument. So um, in 1971, there was some catastrophe in East Bengal, which I guess is Bangladesh, um, and uh, he was describing some of the um, some of the effects of this and describing um, the response of, of Western countries, etc., wealthy countries, rather. So. Um, so far, so good. So far, there isn't exactly any argument. Um, in philosophy, it's quite common for for us to jump right in and um, begin to to give arguments. So let's see. So we've got right here from the get-go. Um, he's making this point, sort of setting out the the detail of the ar or the, the the point of the argument pretty quickly so he'll say that i shall argue that the way people in relatively affluent countries react to situations like that in bengal can't be justified so that there's no moral justification for for our um lack of responsiveness in this case to the situation of the people in in i guess it's bangladesh So let's um, scroll up. Nice thing about this this um, this argument is that he'll flag, as you've seen, he's going to flag some of his premises. So he's going to note that you know these are the kinds of things that he assumes. He assumes that. Um, suffering from lack of food and dying because of you know lack of food that could have been prevented is a bad thing. Um, that's one premise. That here's a critical one. If it's this here, if it's in our power to prevent something bad from happening without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable moral importance, we ought to do do it. That becomes a hugely important premise. Um, that might seem a little bit abstract, but then what he does is he's going to apply the principle. He'll give us this story about the child drowning in the pool, and then reason by analogy from there to the case of the people who are suffering from famine. So the general, the, the principle that he's assuming here at this point is illustrated using the thought experiment here. And then by analogy, he reasons that we have equivalent duties that we do to the child to the people who are suffering in the famine. So what's the, what's the critical thought experiment here? Well, he's saying, look, if I'm 
let's say I'm in, I'm walking past a, you know, let's say I'm at the mall and a child is uh, drowning in the in the fountain or is beginning to drown in the fountain, um, and I'm in a position to to save the child. Um, I'm morally obliged to do so, even though it might be the case that I, I don't know, wet my shoes or damage my shoes in some way. Um, so the s sense in which we're obliged here is a complicated one, but at the very least we would say that it's, it would be morally bad to allow a child to die simply for the sake of avoiding getting your shoes wet. So that's, the, that's meant to move us in this argument, and then by analogy he's going to say we have a similar moral obligation to people in, in distant countries who are suffering in famine, etc. So um, I'm going to let you take a, read through the argument more carefully yourselves, and um, I'll just point out a couple of other major, major features. Um, he argues that just because the people in the in the famine situation are at a greater distance than the child who's in the in the in the mall uh, swimming pool or the mall fountain, it doesn't mean that we're um, under any less moral obligation. So, for example let's say the price of your shoes to replace your shoes was 40 bucks then we might say you know that 40 dollars is certainly um, a harm to you so you you are being harmed by saving the child but we would consider it a bad thing for you not to save the child um, in order to save yourself 40 dollars or the the momentary inconvenience etc well if that's the case then why shouldn't you also be morally obliged in whatever sense Singer has in mind here, why shouldn't you be obliged to spend the $40 to save the life of a child who is 10 miles away? Or if not 10 miles away, then, or well, given that, you know, presumably 10 miles away or 20 miles away or 1,000 miles away, 5,000 miles away, etc. So that the mere distance or proximity of the um, person suffering shouldn't change your moral obligation to that person. So that would also be a premise, I guess, um, an assumed premise, an assumption in the, well, it's an assumption in the, in the argument that he provides. Then what he's going to do is look at some of the implications of the argument. So given that um, we are morally obliged to do this, then there do appear to be some counterintuitive implications, including, let's take a look down here, including the view that our traditional moral categories, or in, including the effect of disturbing the traditional moral categories of duty and charity. So, oops, there we go. So duty and charity, so the distinction between duty and charity ends up not being able to um, be drawn, and that, that might seem counterintuitive. So in philosophy there's this uh, term supererogation, and supererogation just means um, something like going above and beyond the call of, your, of duty, doing more than you have to, to um, more good things than you have to do or than you're obliged to do. And charity is, is, I guess we would traditionally think of charity as supererogatory. You're not obliged to give to charity. It's a good thing to do, but it's a, you know, it's, it is a good thing to do, but it's above and beyond the call of what you're obliged to do. Here, one implication of Singer's arguments, if they're correct, is that the distinction between duty and charity is eliminated, and there really is no such thing as above and beyond the call of duty. Um, so the other powerful or strange implication here is that basically we're not entitled to, on this view, keep any income or resources above the most basic um, necessary to maintain our, you know, our, our well-being. So, and our sort of minimal well-being, actually. So, as long as we 
as long as there are people who are suffering needlessly in the world, then we're not entitled, or we, we ought not um, buy nice clothes, or go on expensive vacations, or have a fancy car, et cetera, et cetera. Um, insofar as you know, that's not necessary to our basic well-being, and it um, that money could be better spent elsewhere. So what I'm going to ask you to do then is take a look at some of the details of the the argument. I'll just say one more thing about what's going on in the actual paper. We're running a little long in this video. Um, so so he's going to try for the rest of the paper then to answer objections to this argument, and um, so. One useful exercise in preparation for the exam would be to attempt to map out what count as reasons for his argument, what are some of the some of the um, assumptions and steps and inferences that he uses in support of his argument, and where is he responding to objections? So if you map out the objections, the the premises and the inferences, the sub arguments. Um, you'll, I think you'll be well prepared for the exercise on the on the first exam. So, in a nutshell, here's a very crude representation of Singer's argument. Um, he assumes that dying in a famine is a bad thing, and we would probably all agree with that. Um, he introduces this principle that if it's in our power to prevent something bad from happening without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable moral importance, then we ought morally to do it. And of course the critical, philosophically interesting um, uh, piece of this, of this principle is without, sac without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable moral importance so this idea of comparable moral importance is centrally you know this is this is the the main point of contention with with singer's argument i think uh then we ought morally do it blah 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 so this is also these two are premises uh this is something that he argues for that proximity and and distance are not morally relevant um it's also, he needs to argue that it shouldn't matter that lots of us are in the position to help um, uh, the folks who are suffering in the famine. So just because lots of us are in this position doesn't absolve us of individual moral responsibility. And then here's the conclusion, which we're stating very explicitly, which I guess is sort of spread throughout the paper, not entire, not stated quite as bluntly as I've done so here. The conclusion is that once we've met our basic needs, we're morally obliged to use our resources to assist those who are in dire need, no matter where they are. So this is the the real sort of blunt um, conclusion of, of, of Singer's very important paper. So go ahead and read the paper for yourselves. Um, begin attempting to map the, the argument again the main exercise here is for you to examine the responses to possible objections, to map those out, to distinguish those from the, the um, core line of argument itself in support of the conclusion. Um, see if you can identify points at which, during the course of the paper, he'll introduce the conclusion. Uh, he'll flag lots of things, lots of premises, lots of assumptions, so it's a very nice, um, nice piece of philosophical writing. Um, so go ahead, that's your exercise for this module.